you said that it was well initially human nature or understanding human nature but also reading chomsky uh which is clear from reading your work your your uh, I don't mm-hmm. want to call you a Chomsky, and that's like a crass way of putting it, but it seems like you're certainly more on, let's say, uh, Chomsky's side over someone like B. F. Skinner. Uh, mm-hmm. So, if I, w- I would, if, if you don't, if you don't mind, I would love for you to sort of uh, elucidate uh, this uh, ongoing. I don't want to call it a war, but debate between uh, the Skinner's side and Chomsky's side, and in fact, in one podcast, you even said that this debate is still ongoing. It's not like it's yeah. Done. yeah very much so I, I, I nothing nothing changes <laughs> yeah like there's not a conclusive this is the answer sort of thing which is which is what's lovely about science in, in my view uh so what's this debate in linguistics and cognitive science uh between Chomsky and Skinner so the debate at the time was how to explain behavior and generally in linguistic behavior in particular and Skinner was hoping to explain that in terms of uh, properties of the information that's available to us, so what's out there in the environment, and and this um, uh, and, and, and responses and the links between them and associations that we form between them. And basically, the idea is that um, to explain how we behave, which is all he cared about, all we need to do is look at the properties of what's out there rather than what the organism brings internally to uh, that, how the organism views the stimulus and how the organism uh, chooses to respond. And um, what Chomsky made very clear is that the study of behavior ought to start with the study of the organism. It's really kind of maybe you can think about it as a form of biology, thinking about what is it that the organism brings with themselves to uh, to to this task. Um, so to make it very, you know very concrete, so why is it that um, you know you you understand a sentence? How is it you know that uh, you have a sentence such as uh, John is eager to please? How do you know that it's John uh, uh, who is being please uh, uh, being uh, pleased? Whereas if you know John is uh, easy to please, then um, sorry put it the other way around. So if John is easy to please, it is uh, the one who is being pleased is John, whereas if John is yeah. eager to please, then he is pleasing Bill or somebody That's else, it. right? Um, and what Chomsky made clear is that uh, interpretations such like that, the only way to make sense of them is to figure out what is it that the person um, knows about language and how they encode the information that's available to them. Um, and he pointed out that uh, our ability to do so, to encode the information that's available to us, is constrained in part by innate principles of language uh, that he called universal grammar. And would you say that's sort of something like uh, innate knowledge that you write about yeah. in this book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I read Chomsky, this is primarily a treatise on human nature and, and, and about innate knowledge, which he happened to advance in the domain of language, but I always read him as a philosopher, essentially. Certainly, yeah. I mean, he, he in fact, I believe he was the, uh, he chaired the Department of Philosophy at MIT uh, probably for a long time. So he has a, a really good background in philosophy, certainly. Uh, um, uh, also, Professor, so uh, with, with the idea of universal grammar, uh, I've always always been thinking about um, that idea. Like, is is un- universal grammar itself this type of innate knowledge, and is it something that that we can sort of study uh, analytically, uh, or Absolutely. yeah, and empirically, empirically, yeah. beautiful, and ex- I would say experimentally, yeah. So, so all you need is, is to start with a good theory of what you think universal grammar is all about. Um, and then go to the lab and, and try to figure out, do you have evidence for this thing? And it's it's not easy, but it's doable. I see, I see. So uh, if, if we could play a bit of devil's advocate, because uh, I've read, uh, I've, in fact, apart from Chomsky's political work, of course, I've read his book uh, on language, which was which was an excellent read. And I found it quite hard to read as a neophyte, to be totally honest. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. 
there, I do know there are certain people still in the field, as you said, it's an ongoing debate that kind of uh, are either critical or disagree with some of Chomsky's ideas, uh, or let's say the ideas of universal grammar. So right. what what are what are the current criticisms with, of this idea of uh, innate knowledge or universal grammar? So to make it clear, I think that in fact the majority of the field no longer thinks that uh, no longer sides with Chomsky. Um, I'm not totally convinced in my reading of the evidence that uh, that's right and that's the right conclusion. Um, the debate, as I, the debates as I see it in the domain of language, um, have always structured or have always centered on two issues. Um, one is what is the machinery that you need to represent language? So what kind of representations that you have and what and what and do they are they structured? Are they uh, structured in a systematic way? Do you need something that is akin to algebraic rules or all you have is basically associations, very rich set of associations, which Apparently, this is what GPT is doing, you know, AI is doing this day. So A is what kind of representations do you have? And do you need um, explicit structure in your data, so to speak? Um, the second question is where these representations and the rules, the way you operate over these representations, where is all this machinery coming from? And is it in part specific to language? So are you born with some principles that are unique to language and that's what allows you to acquire language? Or are you relying entirely on generic mechanisms that, op that operate across domains? So what is your machinery and how specific it is where and where it's coming from? These are have always been the questions. Um, and, and the, the debate these days um, are center on a whether there are in fact algebraic rules. So this is huge debate about that, which has been uh, increased and confounded by the rise of AI because proponents of that state like, look, you have the systems that seem to do just fine. And it, it's not clear, but some people, it, there, there is a question of whether they in fact have any algebraic representations at all. And the range of possibilities range between those who say um, there aren't any structured representations in there at all, or that maybe they start without them and they grow them somehow. Um, and all this becomes really difficult to tell just because there is so much data that these systems are exposed to that it's really hard. So one of the tests that, you know, how do you know that there is an algebraic rules? One of the way to test it is to look at uh, generalizations. Can you generalize to items that are not similar to anything that you've seen before? But if you basically, your data set includes everything that, you know that we have then it becomes very difficult to know whether you in fact generalize or not so that makes the whole question of um, machinery very difficult to decide um, questions of innateness are difficult to decide um, for two reasons a the success of uh, ai that kind of presents a, a big challenge um, the other reason is um, Oftentimes, when you point out that there are universals across languages, so and this is one of the um, main arguments or, or uh, an important argument to foreignness is to argue that, hey, we look at language after language and they all show a certain property. So in my work, we looked at syllable structure and the fact that uh, languages prefer structures such as blog to structures such as LBOG, L-B-O-G. Um, that seems very clear, but the thing about this, as well as many other preferences, is that there is a correlation between what languages like to do and what the functional pressures of our body dictate. So if I ask my undergraduates why blog, then everybody tells me, duh, what to say, and then intuitive theory behind it is that it's those functional pressures, meaning 
how easy it is for you to say it's the, the, the constraints on you, articulatory system and an audition that they are driving the force. Uh, in, in every area of language universal, I don't, in many areas of linguistic universals, you find such, such correspondences between what languages like to do and some functional explanation. Phonology is probably the area where you see those things most clearly, but nowadays people are exploring those ideas elsewhere as well. And the problem is that when people find those correlations, they assume causation, meaning they, if you find any functional explanation of what's going on, people kind of jump to the conclusion that it's this functional cause or functional factor that is causing the structure that you see. So in this specific case, so why do you prefer a blog? Because it's easy to say, or because it's easy to hear. That's what my undergraduates think. And so do professional scientists. And to me, it's not a done deal. Uh, to me, this is an empirical question that you need to go and explore, as indeed we have. And there are ways to do so. So the fact that you find correlation in principle in, in, is ambiguous between two explanations. One is it's not language, it's not UG, it's the functional system, the sensory and motor systems that are driving the car tier. That's what makes language the way it is. Um, but the alternative possibility is, well, Maybe it is abstract linguistic principles that are doing the driving, except for those principles are not entirely crazy. They're not entirely arbitrary. Rather, they have evolved so that they optimize those sensory and motor pressures, which I don't think is super surprising. So that predicts that, yes, you will find some correlation between you know, putative UG and those sensory motor pressures, but no, but what's doing the pushing, what's doing what's pushing the car, so to speak, is UG rather than sensory motor system. And merely showing a correlation doesn't adjudicate between these possibilities. So in my work, we took it very seriously. So for example, to figure out whether it's blog that's doing it, I'm sorry, whether the preference for blog is coming from it's easier for you to say than in collaboration with my colleague Alvaro Pasquale who is a, a neuroscientist who does transcranial magnetic stimulation. What we did is zap the uh, motor system that controls the articulators, the lips specifically, and looked at what this is doing to your linguistic preferences. And conversely, what happens when you zap Broca's area? And what we, we found is a dissociation between them. So the point is, these are questions that you need to explore. You may or may like, may not like the evidence that we uh, produced. I think they are clear, but the, my point is not to defend the solution, but rather to defend the method. I uh, am very concerned about the attempt to jump from correlations to causation. I think this needs to be sorted out. And I think it's this disagreement that is behind a lot of the um, ambiguity that we're having in the field right now. Yeah, hey, Professor, I, I did in fact read uh, a blog post written on your work from your lab uh, by uh, Northeastern University. And so correct me if I'm wrong, in like a very elementary level, if I could put it this way, uh, is, is it that you're at, at the moment claiming that uh, it's as if these like UG or these abstract principles, uh, they've, they've, they aren't, first of all, they aren't arbitrary and random, but mm -hmm. they've kind of evolved to, to suit our, mm -hmm. our existence as, as homo sapiens, the same way, mm -hmm. let's say, a, a physical limb or something has evolved. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I yeah, see. that's that's the working hypothesis. I see. Yeah. But again, I think for me, it's more important to um, tell people that just showing a correlation isn't necessarily proof. It's not a smoking gun of causation. Um, it's more important for me to emphasize this methodological claim than to push my own interpretation of the data. So I think that there is, you know, there is probably a lot that need to be done, many more controls, and and to completely look at this question. And we have contributed some, but by no means I would argue that we completely resolve the issue. What really bothers me is that 
the attempt to view the correlation and to jump to the conclusion that, oh, we know what's going on. I think that's that's really unfortunate. 